Uh, dear participants of the Institute, uh, dear participants of the project dedicated to confiscated letters uh, from the ex-KGB archives in Kyiv, and dear guests, uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, today we are having our last presentation for this first summer institute, and uh, let me introduce our speaker. And our speaker today is Dr. Uh, Sergei uh, Tsipko, and he is assistant director research um, at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. And he is also well-known um, scholar working in the area of Ukrainian Canadian history and uh, culture. And uh, he is author of uh, numerous uh, articles and books. And I would like to uh, name just few, the ones which show his wide interest in uh, uh, Ukrainian studies. Uh, Sergei is author of uh, Ukrainians in Argentina, 1897-1950, the making of a community book. So, uh, and uh, Sergei uh, works not only with uh, Ukrainian communities is in Canada, as you can see, but also studying Ukrainian communities worldwide. Uh, he is also co-author of uh, the one-way ticket, the Soviet return to the homeland, homeland campaign, 1955-1960, and he co-authored it with uh, Glenn Roberts. And he also author of uh, another important recent book, Starving Ukraine, the Holodomor and Canada's response. And this book is the winner of the Canadian Association for Ukrainian Studies Biannual Book Award in 2020. So I am leaving you in capable Sergei's hands. Sergei, please. Thank you, uh, Yelena, for that introduction, and uh, thank you uh, also for in inviting me to give this presentation uh, today. Um, and it's wonderful to see this project, so congratulations uh, on this uh, very important uh, project. Um, I'm going to be sharing with you some examples of my findings uh, from uh, two of the books that um, Yelena mentioned. Uh, oh, um, I'm just seeing if I can. Oh yes, <laughs> uh, the the book. Uh, this books are specifically are starving Ukraine, the Holodomor, and Canada's response, uh, which Yelena already uh, mentioned, and uh, the other one is the co-authored book, the book that I co-authored with Glenna Roberts, One Way Ticket: The Soviet Return to the Homeland Campaign. Um, both. The two books cover different periods. The first one uh, is concentrates on the period 1932-1934. And the second one, as you can see from the title of the book, um, encompasses a later period, uh, 1955 to 1960. Um, so I'll be talking about some examples uh, from my research for those two books. Uh, I want to first begin with the, the groups in Canada that would have received letters uh, from Ukraine. Um, this is based on the Canadian census of 1931. Of course, um, the, the subject of my study, of my studies have been uh, primarily um, uh, Ukrainians. Uh, according to the census of 1931, there were 225,000 Ukrainians, uh, although Ukrainian community leaders um, at the time estimated that there were um, around 350,000 uh, uh, Ukrainians. Now, most of the, uh, the Ukrainians um, in 1931 uh, had origins uh, not uh, so much in the uh, area that was under the Soviet Union, but um, from regions that were in Poland and in 
um, and in Romania. But there were some Ukrainians uh, who um, traced their roots to the territory of uh, Soviet Ukraine. And of course, you know, there, there were Ukrainians uh, who had come from Western Ukraine uh, who also had relatives in, uh, on the other side of the border in, uh, in the Soviet Union. Then there is another group, um, Russians. Um, the Russians were um, ethnically Russian, so there were some Ukrainians who, who were also <clears throat> uh, among them. There were Belarusians. Um, you can see just below there were Mennonites, so some Mennonites uh, may have, um, <clears throat> um, in the uh, in the census of 1931, may have said that they were um, Russians as well. Uh, the Mennonites there. Uh, belong to a, a different category. Um, so the, there were two categories in the 1931 uh, census. Uh, you identified by um, nationality or eth ethnicity. Um, and the, the figure for the Mennonites, uh, who, uh, most of whom came from uh, the Soviet Union and mostly uh, from Ukraine, uh, were in the category for religion, under religion. Uh, Jews were in both categories, and, um, and of course, you know, many Jews came from the uh, former Russian Empire, and uh, Germans, many Mennonites would have um, <clears throat> been, would have given uh, German as their ethnicity. Um, there were many Germans, uh, in addition, not, not just uh, Mennonites, but uh, there were many um, Germans uh, just generally um, who um, trace their ancestry to uh, Ukraine. At that time, uh, just so that you can see how large the, um, or, or, or the, um, how large these groups were in comparison with the total Canadian population, uh, there were um, the, about uh, 10.4 million uh, Canadians at the time. Now, I just wanted to say something about uh, the kind of studies that uh, I remember, you know, from um, <clears throat> my, my work here at uh, my work at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, I remember a presentation back in 2015 by Ron uh, Vosler, um, and I bring this uh, to your attention because it's it's uh, relevant uh, in terms of the uh, subject area. Uh, death scream, ethnic Germans in Soviet Ukraine, right there, uh, Dakota uh, relatives. Uh, that is uh, a lecture that took place um, uh, several years ago. And uh, Ron Vosler, I just, uh, in, in the event that you don't know, did write a book um, on this uh, subject. It's, it was called We'll Meet Again in Heaven. Germans in the Soviet Union write their American relatives and it covers the period 1925 to 1937. Uh, perhaps in the discussion, we, we may talk a little bit about um, uh, his findings, well, uh, as I remember them. Another uh, presentation that I wanted to draw your attention to is um, the one by Colin uh, Newfold, uh, who's an historian at uh, Concordia University of Edmonton. And he presented um, a paper on the perspectives on Soviet collectivization and the Holodomor in Mennonite archives and libraries in North America. And uh, that presentation um, should be published in the Institute's um, journal Ukraina Moderna, which is um, based in Lviv. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the reason I'm, I bring this um, particular presentation to your to your uh, attention is because he mentions um, Mennonite archives in Canada, and of course, um, he talks about uh, he talked about uh, letters in those archives. Okay, now um, I wanted to share with you an extraordinary moment in uh, Canadian history. Um, it happened in the middle of March 1933, when the Saskatchewan legislature paused uh, for about, I, I think it was about an hour, an hour and a half, to, to discuss uh, the famine um, uh, in Ukraine. 
and uh, the uh, and what was extra uh, what was uh, interesting about this particular uh, moment is uh, the letters that they were um, uh, uh, that there was said to the number of letters that were said to have been received from relatives in uh, Soviet, uh, mostly in Soviet Ukraine. Uh, to uh, Mennonites in um, Western Canada, although it, the, the uh, reports didn't say that these were uh, Mennonites uh, specifically. Um, and uh, excerpts fr from these letters were, were read out and uh, the legislature um, <clears throat> came to the conclusion that uh, these people needed to be uh, helped and uh, they uh, suggested you know perhaps you know one way of helping the the um, um the people who were starving was by making an arrangement uh, with the soviet union um <clears throat> uh, through barter um okay so uh, here uh, we uh, for, from the reports about that uh, discussion we know that many um letters were being sent from the Soviet Union uh, to, to Canada. And here, uh, something a little bit more specific, a letter to the editor. And I don't know to what extent you can read that, um, but um, in the events that you cannot read it uh, that well, I will um, read it out loud myself uh, for you. <clears throat> it's um, It was written by um, W.S. Plavyuk uh, from Edmonton. This appeared in the Edmonton Journal, as you can see. And it says, in your edition of March 16th, I noticed an article that the Saskatchewan legislature considers offering shipments of wheat to Soviet Russia to help the starving population. Attention of the Saskatchewan government was drawn by the honorable member of Rostern, Saskatchewan, Dr. J. M. Um, Ulrich, uh, Ulrich, who stated that uh, Mennonites in Rostan district are getting 700 to 800 letters weekly from Soviet Russia asking for help. In the fall of 1932, the Ukrainian Canadians received thousands of letters from Ukraine, granary of Europe before the Great War, asking for help as the conditions to in Soviet Russia are deplorable and bread is considered a luxury. It is remark remarkable that they did not ask for money but for grain and flour. We tried to make arrangements to collect 400,000 to 500,000 bushels of wheat to be shipped to Ukraine, but the Soviet government through their charitable institutions refused to re accept our offer, stating, in view of satisfactory harvest this year, proposal is not necessary in the absence of real need. Okay, so again, there is a reference. Uh, there is reference to thousands of letters, um, the, the seven hundred to eight hundred letters uh, weekly uh, that came. And um, <clears throat> the question that often comes up is, you know, where are those letters? Uh, well, I'll, I'll <laughs> that's that's a good question. But I'll just go on to uh, give you a few more examples before we can discuss. Um, that, that particular question. Okay, well, some of these some of these letters were published in um, the Mennonite newspaper called Der Bote, the Messenger. Uh, here you can see uh, the title of an article, uh, of a lead article in the in the newspaper: um, "Break Your Bread with the Hungry." Uh, so <clears throat> many of the letters that uh, were referred to. Uh, the, among these 700, the, uh, 700 to 800 were published in this uh, newspaper. And uh, this particular newspaper I found in the archives, in the Saskatchewan archives in, uh, in Regina. Um, I'm sure the newspaper, you, you can find it, that newspaper uh, elsewhere as well. Here's an example of one of the letters. Uh, this one was published in December 1932. Um, now, of course, the Mennonites were not the, the only ones uh, who received their letters, as uh, you can see from um, <clears throat> Plavyuk's letter to the editor. And here, um, the Border City Stars is referring to a, a local group 
called the Border Cities Workers Educational uh, Circle. Um, and here uh, they're, they're talking about uh, local uh, Russians who were receiving letters uh, from relatives in the Soviet Union. And, um, you know, I should say that in 1933 and 19, uh, 1933, 1934, there were uh, at least 80 protests that were uh, like this one that had um, taken place across uh, Canada, mostly by uh, Ukrainian groups. So they were organized mostly by Ukrainian groups. Okay, and this is a letter that was received in, um, in Saskatoon. So I will give you an example. I'm giving you an example of how uh, that letter was uh, published. I haven't seen the original one, but uh, this is what Ukrainsky Holos uh, said, about, said about it. And I'll just let you give you a moment to to, uh, to read this um they're talking about the the, the article mentions two uh, letters one that um, was dated to the 24th of april 1933 and another one june 24th 1933 this is how the letter was presented Oops. And this is the this, uh, this, the second letter. Now this letter was translated. The second letter was translated into <clears throat> English, and it was published in the Star Phoenix, third of August, nineteen thirty-three. Um, I, uh, I compared uh, uh, both of them. And it's and it, uh, it looks like the uh, like a good uh, translation uh, to to me. Um, I will read you excerpts uh, of it. It is um, uh, it was uh, written uh, to uh, Fedir uh, Sachinsky in Saskatoon. And um, the letter, the letter uh, reads: "I am writing, I am writing you a sad letter. We already have no parents. Both old people have died, father and mother. Mother had died four months ago, and father died on June twenty-first. Both of them died from starvation. My brother, there is no death more terrible than the death from starvation." The dying person grabs everything within reach and carries to his mouth. To begin with, the body of the starving person swells up very badly. Then the victim falls into a great weakness and dies in a great agony. Almost the whole part of our village has perished in this manner, mostly men. In a word, the suffering is unbearable. The people devour each other. Mothers eat their own children. I do not know what will happen in the future. The spring was quite cold and the winter crops looked pretty well, um, pr but will mature quite late, probably not before August. But at the present, we exist on the linden tree leaves. We pluck the leaves, dry them, and dry them into powder and eat it. We hardly exist. And if you did not send me those $4, the things would have gone very bad with me. When I received the flower for that money, I cried from joy. Now I thank you and your wife deeply and heartily and trust that God will repay you for it. Now I entreat you, help me as much as you can to last out till August. And then the things remain alive to the new harvest. My brother, I wish to live yet, but it is hard. My feet already begin to swell from starvation, and I beg you to help me. My brother, now I write you about father. When he received from you those 
eight dollars he lived on that money while it lasted and after it was spent he had nothing to live on and we had no means to help him so he died from starvation and now try to save me by any means if only with two poods 72 pounds of flour brother i want to live but it is hard and i think you know everything okay so that is the uh, letter now um you can see that a part of that letter made reference to uh, money that was being received and here is a very uh, insightful um, article in the Calgary Herald uh, published in April 1933 uh, which gives an indication of you know why uh, so many letters were allowed to elude uh, this or uh, allowed to go um, uh, were allowed to leave the Soviet Union and um, were received by uh, relatives in Canada. So again, I don't know to what extent you can read this, uh, so I'll re I will read it uh, out. Not all the news from Soviet Russia comes by cable. Soviet authorities allow letters to pass out that tell a different story, which seems strange at first, uh, at, at first thought, but not so strange when one digs in beneath the surface. Here is a letter to a Calgary Russian from relatives in the Soviet Republic. Quote, our father is gone. He was sentenced to six years imprisonment to Solovetsky Islands. We have not heard from him since they took him away. He was appointed as commissar on our village collective farm. I was sentenced be uh, because at uh, threshing time, someone stole a sack of barley. The grain driver and grain weigher way uh, also both got five years. Please help us with a few dollars. In our city, there is a syndicate where there are all kinds of merchandise and food to be bought cheap, but only for dollars. You send the money to the syndicate and they will send us as much good as they, as they feel like. Our winter allowance kept us only until Christmas. Now we are weak and sick with starvation, but have to work. People are dying like in the flu and buried in mass graves, end of quote. And then the Calgary Herald article um, goes on to say, when one understands just where the dollars will go and guesses how little the syndicate will give for them to the sufferers, it is not difficult to understand why such letters are allowed to pass the Soviet censors. Okay, well, here uh, is the syndicate that the Calgary Herald uh, had in mind. It was called the Torxin. Uh, these were um, stores uh, where you could, with American, uh, with any dollars, uh, any hard currency, um, you could buy um, goods and those goods would then um, reach, the, <clears throat> reach the, uh, the people they were uh, destined uh, for. Now, uh, the, these, this, this ad, I, uh, particular, I chose this uh, sp uh, especially because it appeared in a major mainstream newspaper, the Toronto Star. And uh, this one is from 1934. But um, there were parallel uh, advertisements, um, more detailed than this one, uh, in other newspapers. Uh, they appeared in uh, Ukrainian newspapers. Uh, they appeared in um, the... Uh, Canadian Jewish uh, Chronicle and in other places. Now, um, from the from a notice in the Ju uh, Canadian Jewish Chronicle, um, uh, you have a description of um, how that uh, talks in system worked. So I'll just read that out to you. Money remitted by mail, cable, or radio by residents of the United States and Canada to beneficiaries in the USSR will be placed to the credit of the named beneficiary at any one of the talks in stores. The beneficiary could select at the talks in stores any article of food, clothing, or other commodities to the limit of his credit with talks in. And uh, if there was no talks in branch where the beneficiary resided, 
the toxin would send the commodities to the person. A list of companies authorized to receive uh, money and uh, issue merchandise orders was provided in answer notice. Okay, now um, in the articles about uh, the famine that appeared in newspapers like Ukrainske Holos, but in other newspapers too, um, I remember one in particular uh, where uh, the author of the article said, you know, well, you know, well, uh, why are the uh, pro why is the pro-Soviet press not writing about uh, the famine? You know, because uh, surely you know, readers of that press uh, would be uh, receiving letters as well. And of course, uh, uh, they did. Um, but this is an example of uh, an article that appeared in the, in the pro-Soviet um, Ukrainian language newspaper, Ukrainsky Robitnichi Visti, which says, which, which um, had a slogan uh, that was uh, pro uh, circulated both in the Soviet Union and um, by pro-Soviet um, individuals in the calendar as well. Uh, the person who does not work, uh, neither will that person eat. And uh, the articles, the title of this article is, this is the slogan that is now, uh, that is now supported in the Soviet Union. So, um, this is how the pro-Soviet uh, groups um, uh, wrote about uh, the uh, conditions in the Soviet Union. Uh, the, in the, uh, the idea was that uh, the people that uh, were starving were the people that did not want to collect, uh, to join the collective farms, uh, essentially. Now, um, there were uh, letters that were published in that uh, newspaper and, and other uh, pro-Soviet um, um, and the other pro-Soviet pro uh, periodicals as well, um, including one that did come from the uh, countryside that, that, I, uh, that I, I remember. It was a commune that was established by uh, Ukrainian Canadians in uh, southern Ukraine. And um, there, I, I just wanted to, I'll just give you a few examples of what was said in that letter that was published in, in this, this particular newspaper. Um, they were uh, talking about the counter, um, um, the counter revolutionaries. The, the, they did, um, they, they spoke about the sacrifices that were made for this, um, to, to build um, communism at the Soviet, uh, and the Soviet Union. And uh, they did say that there was uh, some hardships, but um, that these were being overcome and that, um, um, that a greater future was being uh, promised. Um, but uh, in, in that uh, particular letter that, um, uh, that I remember, um, <clears throat> there was a um, discussion of a struggle against counter-revolutionaries and uh, petty rights and, um, and so on. Okay, um, now I also want to say uh, something uh, here um, because uh, dates are quite important. Um, even though uh, there were letters that were talking about starvation, uh, the ones that I shared uh, with you, for example, uh, there was still denial that uh, a famine existed. And um, and, and so, you know, the, the, this could only cause a, you know, a confusion, probably. Um, but this particular article, as you can see, was already published in uh, September 1930, after there had been a new harvest um, in the Soviet Union in, in Ukraine. And um, there was an admission of sorts made already um, yeah, by, by the late uh, summer of 1933, uh, which was beginning to be published in September and um, by a Soviet official that a famine had existed. Um, that official was Alexa uh, Alexander uh, Asatkin. And, um, and uh, he was quoted in the mainstream press. Um, he acknowledged that there had been mortality from undernourishment 
Um, but he claimed that the numbers um, that, that it was in, that uh, the deaths were in numbers considerably lower than the millions stated abroad. And um, as Satkin, the, you know, then went on in the reports that were published about him, <clears throat> about his admission, uh, blaming the peasants for the, tr the troubles, alleging uh, alleging that they had believed that that after they joined the collective farms, the government would take care of them. Now um, he was quoted as saying. They had been taught the bitter lesson that, quote, those who won't work, won't eat, uh, end of quote. Okay, now I want to, uh, I haven't seen um, too many original uh, letters, but this was one that uh, came to my notice. And uh, it came from the journal Ukrainsky Filatelistechny Wiesnik. Uh, I don't follow it. But of course, um, um, specialists in, in uh, letters, you know, um, I, I, I'm sure uh, do. Um, anyhow, this one came to my notice. It was published in 2002, and it came and it's a letter from Calgary, as you can see. And um, it was addressed to uh, Peter uh, Derus in uh, Calgary. And it came from the uh, Khmelnytsky uh, uh, Oblast. Okay, and, and this is, uh, and uh, the, I uh, eventually got a photocopy of this uh, letter. Um, the original is in the Ukrainian Orthodox um, Archives um, in, a Museum in, the, in Calgary. And um, as you can, and it's rendered uh, faithfully uh, here in, uh, in print. So this is how it uh, looked, looked like. And, um, and as you can see, it's, um, uh, <clears throat> there's a little bit more uh, additional information there at the bottom, but um, I, I have the, uh, um, I will read to you the letter in English uh, translation. So this is how it reads in English. This letter is from your daughter Maria to her father. I inform you, dear father, that I am at this time, thank God, still alive. I ask you, dear father and mother, to send me any help you can because I am dying of hunger. While I was with mother, she was able to feed me, but mother has now died and I am alone and perishing from hunger. I cook fodder beets and live off them. I go around to the store, the toxin, where they get flour from relatives um, from America, and they get all kinds of food products. And I can only look and cry and then go home. I sit at home and ask you not to ignore my request. I have written so many letters to you, but I have not received any reply from you. Okay. Um, so these are, are examples from 1932, um, 34 that I've been uh, sharing with you. Uh, I want to sh uh, now move on to some examples from the research that I conducted with uh, Glenna Roberts on the Soviet return to the homeland campaign. Uh, the book, um, The One Way Ticket, was published in 2008, and uh, those of you who will ever consult it, um, we'll, uh, we'll see that there are many, many references to, uh, to letters. Now, um, the, this campaign that began after Stalin's death in 1955 was aimed to try to persuade um, people who had origins in the Soviet Union uh, to, re um, to resettle, or, um, just to return, to, uh, uh, to the homeland, and they did this um, <clears throat> through newspapers such as the one that you, you see before you. This is this newspaper is titled Zapovernenya na Batkyovschenu, um, in Ukrainian. It, it is uh, so in English. It, uh, the English translation would be for the return to the homeland. And there were par parallel newspapers for other groups. You know, for Rus uh, there was a, um, a Russian language uh, newspaper. There were. There was a newspaper for Belarusians and, and so on. Um, 
This one um, isn't available online. Yeah, there, there are a few uh, issues of this one uh, that, is, uh, that, uh, that are available. And I did this, like I copied this particular uh, title as a result. Um, this is a letter from uh, Irena uh, Polyancel uh, to friends in Toronto. And well, it's, it's quite hard to, to read, but um, it's a, um, but many of these followed, you know, predictable uh, formula. And um, I will just read you one um, sentence, one telling sentence uh, uh, from this, from this one. Um, the friends are told, we realized that we, the Soviet people, had nothing to do abroad, that our place was, uh, that our place was there at home and not in Canada. The anguish became unbearable. Um, ultimately, there were about, uh, uh, several hundred um, people that did settle from, resettle from Canada uh, to the Soviet Union. That, that includes, you know, people who um, were born in Ukraine, but not, um, not a, people that were born in Ukraine, but had no experience with the, so uh, with the, Soviets, um, uh, with the Soviet Union. They were born in Western Ukraine, so under Poland. And... Um, <clears throat> and uh, resettled in 1956, 57, and, um, and so on, plus their um, Canadian-born children. Now, um, before I go to that, um, to give you an example of a letter that was confiscated, I just wanted to say that um, in that book, I, um, the, we uh, quote uh, um, extensively um, one of our uh, informants, you know, the, one of the people that we interviewed, Nadia Golik Davidenko, and um, she said that, uh, in reference to a letter, my cousin said she wrote to my father that if he came back, uh, he would have ex he would have exactly the same kind of life a certain person had. Since this man was the most miserable, poorest person in the village, my father was supposed to get the message to stay away. Well, um, and the, the parents did not break the code. And um, in spite of that veiled warning, uh, they did return or resettle in, uh, in 56. Um, on the other hand, you know, what I wanted to say um, in reference to such to, uh, to letters uh, in this context is that letters describing um, <clears throat> conditions in the Soviet Union with warnings not to return, never arrived. Um, and then Jim Lenko gave the examples, the example of a letter from his sister, and I'll quote him. She and her, and her husband and two children had gone a month before us. And when they arrived in Leningrad, uh, St. Petersburg, they knew exactly what, what was happening, knew it was all wrong. She wrote us a letter immediately telling us not to come, uh, but that letter never arrived. You know, the KGB in those days, they would have read it. She tried to tell us. Okay, now, um, whereas there was uh, several hundred people um, that left Canada for the uh, Soviet Union in 1955 to 1960, um, there were a few thousand that had actually uh, resettled from South American countries to, um, uh, to the Soviet Union. And um, this uh, movement, uh, you know, was uh, such that um, you know major newspapers like the New York Times um, had correspondents, you know, writing uh, reports about um, people boarding ships that went to uh, Odessa uh, from uh, Buenos Aires, and um, yeah, the individuals were uh, interviewed, and I just and I will just um, share with you one example of. Um, what was said by the interviewees, that those people who agreed to be interviewed. Um, this person told the New York Times, why am I leaving after 18 years here? Well, I don't think money can be harder to find there than, than it is here. Besides, letters from my family say that life is much better there now that the Ukrainians are not under Polish uh, domination. And um, the New York Times concluded that... Um, 
that the, the interviewees uh, would not say that so they that had any pressure um, be that be being applied to them beyond letters from relatives. Okay, well, um, here we come to one uh, example of a complicated letter that I know of uh, personally, and um, you can see this one. Uh, this was a, um, this this came to me from um, uh, John Paul Hemke, who was my thesis um, uh, supervisor, and uh, who knew that I was. You know, working in in this um, particular uh, on Ukrainians in Argentina, um, and uh, by extension, afterwards the uh, Soviet return to the homeland uh, campaign, and um, it, it was a letter that was confiscated at a post office in Kiev from the and it comes from the private collection of Viktor Mohelny. This was oh I don't know how many years ago. Um, <clears throat> Um, that now that uh, this letter uh, came to my notice, but anyway, um, I uh, I have translated it. It, it, uh, it was um, in Spanish, and I've translated it um, into English, and I'll uh, read read it out for you because it gives you an example of a letter that was confiscated, and uh, then you can decide for yourself, uh, you know, why <laughs> this particular letter uh, would have been uh, confiscated. And, um, and this, uh, um, well, anyway, I'll read it out first. Dear friends, in the first words of this letter, I want you to know that we are all well in, uh, in health and wish the same of yourselves. We already have received your letter for which we are grateful. We already have been given a house with gas and heating, but even so, it cannot be compared with over there. I am studying more or less fine. My brother is working as a mechanical fitter, my, my father at the foundry, and my mother as a silk weaver. My mother works three shifts, afternoon, morning, and night. The factory is close to all of us. We miss you a lot. Dear Anita, you ask me if I with my brother would like to come to your home to drink yerba mate. I would like that very much. And if I could, I would do so right now. Right if you can, please help. I ask this of you and also my, my, my um, tios, uh, that's uncles and aunts. Um, in Kiev, there are 13 families, residents of Argentina. When we get together in the evenings, we all speak of how it was over there. We, in every minute, remember you in our words. My mother also remembers you and also the factory. Write to us when a ship will sail, will sail from uh, for here. Who is traveling? Those who are thinking of traveling should do it more to the chief cities because if they go to the countryside, it is the misery. You also ask if my grandmother is with us. She has always prepares the meals for us. Okay, for now, I did not have the, um, I did not have Anything more to write? Many hugs and kisses to all from us. Regards and kisses. My mother sends her regards to the boss of the factory and to the mother of uh, to all. Prompt uh, reply. Write write much. Find out. A million thanks for the postcard. It is very pretty. And as you can see, this is from this came from uh, <clears throat> Lydia Elena Krenievich. Uh, Okay, I will end there, and we can discuss uh, perhaps some, some of these uh, letters a little bit more. But thank you.